Damien, you're looking a little low. I am. Let's see. Is that better? Good morning, and welcome to another episode in our museum's Stay Connected Facebook Live series. I'm your host, historian Edna Friedberg. Though this summer, the coronavirus has forced the postponement of the planned Olympic Games, we're bringing you a conversation about the 1936 Olympics held in Nazi Berlin. There are so many compelling stories from this moment in history, ranging from the personal experience of athletes to the German government's campaign to camouflage its discriminatory policies. Please join me in welcoming today's guests. First, Dr. Damian Thomas, who is the sports curator at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Hi, Damian, good morning. Good morning, thank you for having me. I'm excited to uh, participate in this conversation. Glad to have you on and maybe sometime we'll actually meet in person instead of just uh, through a box on the screen. Uh, our other guest is uh, my former colleague, Dr. Daniel Green. Uh, Danny is president of the Newberry Library in Chicago, and he also served as curator of the Holocaust Museum's current special exhibition, Americans and the Holocaust. Danny also conducted research for an earlier exhibition about the 1936 Olympics here at our museum in DC. And so we're glad to bring him back to share some of that knowledge. Hi, Danny. Hi, Edna, thanks. How are things in Chicago? Things are all right. <laughs> As much as Hang anywhere. Uh, we ask you, our viewers, to please post your questions for our experts in the comment section, and we'll get to as many of them live in the course of the show as we are able. Also, if you experience any technical glitches during the course of the show, um, don't worry about it. Don't stress. It will be available to view on demand immediately after we conclude. So how did Germany come to host the Olympics in 1936? It actually predates the Nazi era. Uh, in 1931, Germany was awarded the right to host the 1936 Olympic Games, uh, which was a very powerful signal. It signaled its return to good standing in the international community following uh, the First World War. In 1933, Nazi party leader Adolf Hitler was appointed chancellor, and his government quickly transformed Germany's fragile democracy into a dictatorship that persecuted Jews and thousands of others based on a racist ideology in which so-called Aryans were superior. Leaders and average people here in the United States were becoming increasingly alarmed at Germany's turn toward a violent police state, and this made them wary of competing in the Berlin Games. So against this backdrop, I'd like to start with you, Damien. Can you tell us a little bit about the debate over whether the United States should participate in the Berlin Games? I think you're absolutely right that this became a serious point of contention. Americans from the international, excuse me, the American Olympic Committee, the Amateur Athletic Union debated this and they debated it vigorously, even taking trips to Germany to, to see things for themselves. Avery Brundage, who was one of the leading figures in American sports was a vociferous supporter of the ideas of American participation. And in a very close vote, the American delegation decided to, to uh, continue to uh, support the Olympics and, and to participate. And it wasn't just sports organizations who were um, weighing in on this debate. I know um, Jewish organizations, the NAACP, the uh, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, um, many people and many groups saw the symbolism there, right? Definitely. I think, uh, I think it, was, it was widely debated and discussed and the NAACP um, certainly had strong feelings about, about this issue. Um, as I understand it, they initially supported a boycott of uh, participating, but once it was decided um, that they would send a delegation, they were supportive of the athletes, is that right? That's true. So Danny, let's put a little more of a, a personal face on this because this isn't just about abstract boards or uh, organizations making a stand, but it's about uh, athletes, young athletes, many of whom have trained their entire lives for this, this moment. Could you share a couple of these stories, please? 
Sure, absolutely. And, you know, many of them were in college at the time. They were they were college students and many college presidents had actually come out and uh, supported a, a boycott of the games as well in 1935. Um, one athlete's story who stands out is a, a hurdler at, uh, named Milton Green. He was a, a senior at Harvard um, at the time. Here you see Milton Green running the 110 meter high hurdles. And uh, he had times uh, in the race that would have qualified him for the Olympics. Um, and along with a, a Harvard teammate, another Jewish athlete named Norman Connors, um, Green and Con here you see Green and Connors, they meet um, with Green's family rabbi, um, a, a man named Harry Levy uh, in, at, at Temple Israel in Boston. And the rabbi talks to these two young men and says, you know, it would send a real strong message about fair play um, and um, about standing up to discrimination if you boycott the games. Um, and so Milton Green and Norman Connors do boycott the games. They're uh, two of the only American athletes who decide um, that they that they're going to boycott the games at the time. And it's it's that's a big ask of a young uh, college athlete um, who's been training for um, something for their whole lives, right? To to say I'm going to sit this one out. Um, and and you have to think about in 1936, what did Americans know about what was going on in Nazi Germany? Green and Connors certainly knew that there was persecution of Jews and discrimination against Jews. Um, but of course, they lived in a society um, in the United States with discrimination against Jews and, of course, discrimination against African Americans as well in, in, in Jim Crow America. Um, so um, they, um, they make the courageous decision to, to, to stand up and boycott the games. And despite the intensity of that um, personal sacrifice, and for sure the the really wrenching disappointment they must have felt, they didn't they didn't talk publicly about this decision, did they? It was really just kind of a, a personal thing. That's right. That's right. And they they don't they don't speak out about the games once they decide not to not to not to participate. I want to wish a good morning or a good afternoon, depending on where you are, to visitors, to, uh, sorry, viewers who are watching. I use museum speak all the time, visitors. Uh, someday we will have visitors in our buildings again. But um, to viewers who are watching from around the world, thank you for joining us from Greensboro, North Carolina. Good morning to you in New Jersey, in Boynton Beach, Florida, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, San Francisco, and internationally, we're glad to have you with us watching from Sao Paulo, Brazil, Cairo, Egypt, uh, good morning to you in El Salvador, Peru, uh, and in Stockholm in Sweden. Again, I'll ask you to please post your questions in the comments section so that Damien and Danny can answer them. So Damien, uh, Danny's given us a sense of how it played out for a couple of college students um, who could relate on a very personal level as Jews. Um, how did African-American athletes grapple with the question of whether to compete or boycott? was a difficult question because for African Americans, the Olympics and sports had been a primary vehicle through which African Americans had sought to fight against racial discrimination um, by, by embodying the ideals of the amateur athlete. They saw themselves as challenging notions of race and racial oppression. Some of them were also concerned about whether they would face discrimination in Germany. And so they, they had legitimate concerns and worries, but ultimately many of them saw this as an opportunity to compete at the highest levels of the sport and then to use their success as a way to speak to African-Americans ability. Because at the time in America, there was the notion that intellectual capacity and athletic ability went hand in hand. And it was sort of epitomized in the phrase, healthy mind, healthy body. And so African-Americans use sports to say, look at what we can do when we're given a chance to compete on equal terms. And so for African-Americans, their sporting success had much wider meaning. And because of the oppression that that they faced in the United States. They saw it as, as their, their duty to uh, go represent the best of America, the best uh, Black America at the Olympic Games. And to recognize that the experience of, of Black Americans was not the same as of other Americans. Um, I mean, I'm acutely aware waking up this morning, seeing the news from Kenosha, this is not uh, a, a topic or a struggle that is entirely in the past. And thinking about that these athletes in 1935, 36, 
are experiencing pervasive and even legalized discrimination at home, and yet they're going to go and represent, represent their country. Um, I also wanted to ask you, Damien, had uh, African-American athletes represented the U.S. at games in the past, or was this something new? African-Americans had been involved in the Olympic Games uh, since the, the beginning of the modern Olympics. Uh, the first African-American to win a medal was a, at the, the 1904 Olympic Games. And so um, there had been a long history of African-Americans being involved. But 1936 was, was special because this was a, a year where we had a critical mass, where there were 18 African-Americans who, who competed in the game. So this was a, a, a watershed moment in many ways. Right, and extremely um, visible in a way that had not been before. And in fact, in the end, um, 49 nations, the largest contingent ever, sent teams to Berlin, um, which the Nazis were um, thrilled about. It really legitimized their place, um, not only in the eyes of the world, but also for domestic consumption to their um, population at home to say, look, we are respected, um, we are included. So Danny, in that vein, the Germans knew that the world was watching. How did they prepare for the international attention that the Olympics uh, would bring to their, to their city and to their nation? the Germans had a chance to show off uh, during the games in, in 1936. It's also, it's a return for Germany back into the community of nations after World War I as well, right? Which is only, um, you know, not even 20 years in the rearview mirror in 1936. One of the things that Germany does to prepare for the games is they hide overt signs of discrimination. So there had been anti-Jewish signs um, posted publicly, persecution of Jews publicly. All those signs are removed from Berlin for two weeks in August in 1936. Um, there are uh, Roma um, living in the, in the streets in Berlin who are rounded up um, by Nazi Germany and removed to a concentration camp outside of Berlin so that visitors don't see overt signs of discrimination against Jews or Roma or others. Um, and then there's just such a great deal of pageantry um, at the games. Um, I think we're gonna see some video of that now. Um, uh, you see Nazi flags everywhere here hanging on the Brandenburg gate, um, Nazi flags. Um, the, the Germans um, instate the torch relay run that we know so well. So this um, torch relay run begins in Athens and ends in Berlin. So what are the Germans um, communicating there? That they are the literal inheritors of um, Greek civilization, right? And Germany is the, new, um, is the new Greece, the center of civilization. Here you see Hitler walking into the stadium um, at the beginning of the games in August of 1936. So there, this, uh, the Germans bring a lot of pomp and a lot of pageantry to the games. Um, and a lot of what they bring uh, is still with us today when we, when we watch the Olympic games um, every, uh, every fourth year. Um, but they communicate to the world um, that they are back in the community of nations, that they are one of the most advanced nations. And they cast doubt, even, even some American journalists and other international journalists who go over there um, report that they don't see signs of overt, overt discrimination, even though we had been hearing about that um, for three years that the Nazis had been in power already. So this sanitized version of Nazi Germany, um, it actually dupes a lot of people, or at least it's given a, a spotlight. Um, I think we had one more image I just want to mention, and um, it's something that um, I've, I've studied and written about. Uh, the torch, um, you know, it's not just theatrical, it also um, adds a kind of false evidence to the idea that the Aryan myth, that they are some kind of ancient people rooted in an older culture. Um, this is a way of amplifying that um, quite, quite vividly and in, in person. That's right, that's um, right. And to see the Nazi flags on that Brandenburg Gate photo, the Nazi flags that, uh, next to the Olympic flags, stand for fair play and internationalism. And of course, that's not at all what Nazism stands for, um, but they're, they're able to, um, to mesh those ideals in August, or at least to, um, to dupe visitors, as we've said. So Damien, um, the symbolism of these games, and it's particularly fraught, um, was also quite, quite strong and vivid uh, for African Americans. We have an editorial cartoon that I'd like us to take a look at. And if you could please unpack it for our viewers uh, who may not uh, understand all the symbols in it. What are we looking at here? 
Sure. This was an editorial cartoon which was um, featured in the Pittsburgh Courier, which was the leading African-American newspaper at the time, an incredibly wide circulation. It was said that for every paper uh, that they sold, seven people read it. And so they were able to, to, to sort of share this message, this idea of African-Americans, um, the 18 African-Americans who participated in the games, sort of representing America, representing American ideals, and being champions, not just of, of American um, athletic prowess and success, but also representing African-Americans as, as uh, leading citizens in, in the U.S., certainly the embodiment of these amateur ideals of, of gentlemanly and ladylike um, um, ability. So these, this group of 18 known as the Black Eagles and their names are listed here um, on these banners or um, placards that they're holding. To tell us a couple of stories of them. Who were they, where did they come from and how did they perform in Berlin? Certainly the most famous of, of this group is, is Jesse Owens. Jesse Owens who won four medals, became one of the most recognizable and important African-American symbols of success and accomplishment. This image that we see of Jesse Owens right now is really important because we have memorialized this moment um, in the National Museum. We have a statue of Jesse Owens uh, that that is drawn from this particular image because it really does speak to, to African-Americans athletic ability, but it also speaks to, to the larger lessons that we learn through sports of, of hard work, discipline, um, of persevering through adversity. And so we wanted to make sure that we were honoring um, what physical accomplishment meant in the African-American struggle for greater greater rights and freedoms. And certainly there is John Woodruff, who um, is from the University of, of Pittsburgh and a middle distance runner, who essentially came out of nowhere to win, to win gold in the 800 meter race. He would also go on to be a Tuskegee Airman, which means he was a, a fighter pilot for the US military during World War II. And, and that's really important because at the time being a fighter pilot was one of the most prestigious jobs that you could have. And as African-Americans tried to tie their, their war service to, to the fight against racism in the United States, people like John Woodruff, who on the Olympic field also was a symbol of black, black American achievement, also was a, a symbol during the war given his, his ability to, to occupy um, this very prestigious and, and demanding job as a, as a Tuskegee Airman. And lest people look back and think that um, they were just part of the general fight, I wanna remind our viewers also that the United States military was still segregated at the time. So part of why you have a unit, in fact, the reason that you have a unit like the Tuskegee Airmen is because um, African-American pilots were not allowed to integrate into other, other units. Um, so how did athletes, um, a track runner like Owens or a middle distance runner like Woodruff, how did they perform um, once they reached the arena in Berlin? They succeeded beyond, beyond measure and were essential to the, the success of the U.S. team. Um, yeah, we see here Jesse Owens. Um, here he actually he won four gold medals, became one of the most celebrated athletes at the Olympics. And here he is with the Olympic laurel on his head um, in his uh, team vest, um, showing off his medals. Um, Woodruff also took a gold medal in the 800 meter race. And um, I just, you know, I, I'm really struck uh, by also the, the climb and how unlikely and how many odds uh, these young athletes, and they were very young, had to overcome. Um, Owens was the youngest of 10 children of a sharecropper farmer, an impoverished tenant farmer. John Woodruff uh, was the grandson of enslaved people and uh, the first in his family to finish high school. And really it was um, college that um, brought them you know, to sports. Um, am I right, Damien? I think Woodruff was only 21, right? When he competed at the games? He was, he was 21. It was a college 
college student, uh, just like Jesse Owens was also a college student. He was a student at, at Ohio State. And it, it's also important to remember that, that they were competing in the North, which provided African-Americans with uh, more opportunities to, to compete at the highest levels of, of uh, amateur sports. And so um, certainly these are, are two men who, who came from humble beginnings to um, become important symbols of, of America and, and African-American ambition and success. And, they're, and they're, you mentioned, go ahead, Danny. I mean, they're stars at their own schools, but they also, they face segregation at those schools also, right? And so, I mean, these, these young men and, and, and women who compete also just um, reflect, I think, in powerful ways about what it meant to go over to Germany wearing a uniform that said USA when they don't have um, anywhere near full equality um, in, in the USA at the time. Um, they, they were very aware of that contrast, right? And the, um, there's a hope for promise of equality, um, but, but the athletes were, I, I, th I think many of the athletes, right, Damien, really um, were aware of that, of that contrast between the promise and the, and the reality. Um, I'd like to ask people again to please post your questions. Um, we're also going to be sharing some links uh, if you'd like to explore more about um, the state of the United States during this time and also about the Olympics. Um, one question that comes up a lot, Damien, and that I'd like you to um, address and kind of uh, put it to rest, uh, is it true that Hitler snubbed Jesse Owens and refused to, to shake his hand? Is that a myth or is it real? It's yes and no. Um, it is certainly true that, that Hitler did not shake Jesse Owens' hand. What had happened was that during the first day of competition, Hitler had, had went down and greeted and shook the hands of, of German athletes who won medals. The International Olympic Committee went to him and said, um, if you're gonna shake the hands of German athletes, we would like you to shake the hands of every athlete who wins, who wins a medal. And Hitler decided that, that moving forward, he wouldn't shake the hands of, of any of the athletes. And Jesse Owens took advantage of this moment. Um, when he came back to the US, he didn't have a lot of opportunities to capitalize on his athletic success. But when uh, this story began to circulate that Hitler had snubbed Jesse Owens, and Jesse Owens used it for his, his benefit. Um, and he began to give lectures at, at, at dinners and things like that. And that was often one of the most, the most uh, requested stories about how he had been snubbed by Jesse Owens. And so it just became part of the myth of his experience in Germany. So it wasn't a, a personal repudiation. He just wasn't shaking anybody's hand after that. Um, let's hear actually directly in his own voice and words from John Woodruff, as I mentioned earlier, gold medalist in the 800 meter, um, about what it meant to him to win in that particular Olympic Games. Well, it, it, made, me, it made me feel good because what we did, we destroyed his mass race theory. Because, you know, he, he had that mass race theory that, you know, the, the, the the superior race that only 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 the pure germans could do certain things in this world that was what he was advocating but we destroyed his theory whenever we start winning those gold medals what's your reaction to that damien I, I, I sympathize with Mr. Woodruff's sort of position, but I, I, I think I would, I would disagree with that because what happens after the, the 36 Olympics, we have to remember that Germany won the most medals at the 1936 Olympics and they used their success to, to suggest that they were the superior, superior race. Certainly if you, you uh, think about Lenny, Reichman Stahl's amazing uh, documentary about the Olympics is this celebration of, of German excellence and athletic prowess and tying them back to the ancient democracies in, in, in Greece. 
And so while in America, we often will sort of emphasize the success of Jesse Owens and other Americans as sort of, sort of repudiating those ideas, the Germans certainly didn't, didn't see it that way. And even more yeah. than that, the German propaganda um, is, is, can very easily explain away why uh, African-American athletes uh, dominate at, at the games, which they do. I mean, the, not, the Nazi racist propaganda um, starts to argue that um, African-Americans are faster or can jump higher because they're more animalistic, right? So it doesn't, um, their victories, um, unfortunately, don't, they're certainly not, they don't change any opinions in Nazi Germany. And unfortunately, they don't change many opinions in the United States as well. I think, I think that's an important point to, to, to remember as well, is that what happens with Owen's success and the success of these athletes and African Americans becoming more dominant in the sports world is the meaning of sports begins to change. Um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, you had this idea of healthy mind, healthy body, the idea that athletic ability and intellectual capacity go hand in hand. And that's why sports are so intricately linked to our American educational system. However, when African Americans began to dominate and excel in sports, the meaning of sports changes. And rather than those two things supporting each other, you began to see people argue that they're actually inversely related. So one of the things that propels the success of African Americans in sports is the idea that if you are athletic superior, athletically superior, then you must be intellectually inferior. And so it still is, is, such a, is, is, is articulated in such a way that African-Americans, despite their success, be dis become described as, as less than, than white Americans and others. So it's a way that the stereotypes um, and the racism morph. Um, I know there's a, a lot written about, especially the black male body, but the idea that they can't possibly be this level of achievement, it's something almost uh, brutal about them, right? Um, we do have a really interesting perspective here. Um, Frank Cohen, who is a Holocaust survivor who volunteers at our museum here in DC, uh, shared actually his personal recollection that when he was 11 years old, he was listening to the Olympic games on the radio, remember this before TV. And he wrote, and I quote, we cheered the black athletes, particularly Jesse Owens, since by then we were aligned with our parents in opposition of German nationalism and were not sorry when the German athletes lost. So for 11-year-old Frank, a, a Jewish kid, um, that summer on a farm, um, he felt um, glad. He felt some of what John Woodruff was describing. Um, Danny, we have a, a question um, from a viewer named Beryl asking, did any um, Jewish athletes compete in the Berlin Olympics? Jewish athletes did compete in the Berlin Olympics, but in uh, small numbers. One Jewish athlete in the Winter Games, which are held in February in Germany in 1936, and one Jewish athlete um, in the in the Summer Games. And it's you know been speculated that the Germans included one Jewish athlete in, in on each team to be able to say, look, we're not discriminating discriminating against Jewish athletes. Uh, the Jewish athlete who competed in the Summer Games, Helena Meyer, uh, is a fencer. Um, she um, was a dominant fencer. She had already won a gold medal in the 1928 games, um, had competed in Los Angeles in 1932, and then stayed in LA um, rather than returning to Germany. In part, I think, concerned for her own um, safety once the Nazis took power in, in 1933. Um, Helena has one Jewish parent, um, and she wins a silver medal at the 1936 games in fencing. She's remembered um, most for her moment on the podium. Here she is on the right of this photo. Um, Helena Meyer had features that uh, the Nazis would have described as quote, Aryan features, um, a, a blonde haired woman. And she's giving the Nazi salute um, on the podium, a, a, a Jewish woman, which was um, expected of all German athletes. Um, and there's a lot of speculation about why Helena Meyer did this. Some people say that she did it to protect her family members who were still in Germany. She was worried, um, especially for her brothers who were still 
um, living in Germany. So um, it, that that's possible. Others say that she did it to try to rehabilitate her own image in in Germany. We'll we'll never know. But it's it's a troubling moment um, to see Helena Meyer um, giving giving that Nazi salute at that time. Um, this is the last Olympics that she competes in, and she actually. Uh, returns to the United States um, after the Olympics, returns to California, um, and doesn't go back to Germany until the the, the early 1950s and um, dies as a, a relatively young woman in the early 1950s. Please do post your questions, uh, both for Damien and for Danny in the comments section. Um, Danny, we do have a couple of questions that I'd like to combine. Um, a person named Susan is asking whether the college students you mentioned earlier uh, who boycotted participation? Did they participate four years later or have ever at all? And actually, I think we can combine them. Uh, Suzanne from Pittsburgh and Barry from New York have both asked about Marty Glickman and Sam Stoller, two athletes we haven't yet mentioned, um, but we were planning to do their story. So let's uh, do that now if we could. Sure. To the first question, uh, no one competes four years later. There are no Olympic games during World War II. So there's no Olympics in 1940. Um, and there's no Olympics in 1944. We have a, a gap between 1936 and 1948. So, you know, if you're a 20, 20 or 22 year old athlete um, in 1936, by 1948, you're in your mid thirties and you're out of your prime. So the, the people who hoped, oh, I'll, I'll compete in four years, um, never had that opportunity. Uh, Marty Glickman and Sam Stoller are two um, American Jewish athletes, um, sprinters. Um, Glickman here is on the left. He's a freshman at Syracuse um, University in, in New York um, in 1936. And Sam Stoller is a runner at the University of Michigan. Um, they go over on the Olympic team, these two Jewish athletes, to participate in the four by 100 meter relay, one of the last track and field events. And just before um, the race happens, they're told by the, the American coach, Dean Cromwell, that they're going to be replaced on the relay team by Jesse Owens and, and another African-American sprinter, Ralph Metcalf, two, arguably the two fastest uh, men on the team, faster than, than Glickman and Stoller to be, to, to be sure. Um, Marty Glickman, I had the chance to, to meet and talk with Marty Glickman a few times before he, he passed away. He, he attributed this to anti-Semitism and to not wanting the American Olympic Committee not wanting to show up Hitler any more than they already had by having Jewish athletes win um, win medals at the games. And with Glickman and Stoller's times, um, they probably would have run one running with running uh, with that team with with Owens and, and Metcalf. Um, it's a dominant race, and the Americans win the gold medal. Um, we don't know. We 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 won't know for sure why Glickman and 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 Stoller were um, replaced. Glickman was quite outspoken about it throughout much of his life. Sam Stoller said very little um, about this after the games, um, although the little bit that he did say about it, he didn't. He, he wasn't as sure that it was anti-Semitism among the American Olympic Committee that that led to the to to the removal or the replacement of these two runners at the at the last minute. Um, it ultimately allows Jesse Owens to win his fourth gold medal at the game. He went over to run three races and ends up running four and or, or competing in four events, sorry, um, and, and winning, winning four gold medals. Damien, we have a not dissimilar story um, in the case of the, the lone two African-American women athletes who are at Berlin. Could you tell us uh, about these two women, please? Sure, Tidy Pickett and Louise Stokes were members of the, the uh, 1932 team. Um, and should have had an opportunity to compete in Los Angeles, but they, they didn't get a chance to compete despite excelling in their events. Um, in 1936, those two women were, were put on the Olympic team again. Tidy Pickett, um, who, who was a hurdler, was, actually became the first African-American woman to compete in the Olympic Games when she competed in the, the 80 meter hurdles. Um, unfortunately, she hit one of the hurdles in one of the earlier races, broke her foot and wasn't able to, to, to make it to the finals. Louise Stokes was on the team, but um, didn't get a chance to, to compete in her, her, uh, her running race. This was also important because they were in many ways um, caught up in, in both the racial dynamics, but also the gender dynamics. 
of the 1936 Olympic Games. And so these two women became uh, the first of many African-American women who would go on to dominate women's track and, track and field by the early 1950s. And so their sacrifices and dedication helped pave the way for, for a later generation. We have a couple of viewer questions for you, Damien. Um, a viewer named Darcy, first of all, sending greetings from Chicago, a place that all of us have connections to. So thank you, Darcy. Um, Darcy's asking, can you share some of the discrimination and challenges that America's Black athletes faced after they returned home from Berlin? Were they received as heroes? Sure. If you think about the story of Jesse Owens, um, at the time, the greatest track and field performance in history, um, immediately after the Games, the American Olympic Committee went on a tour of Europe, and they had the athletes competing after two or three days. So it was a, it was a grinding performance and, and they were trying to raise money for, uh, to, to offset the expenses of, of the uh, participating in the Olympics. Jesse Owens, Jesse Owens, who was worn out, who was tired, um, decided to go home and he was actually barred from, from competing in, in track and field. That, that's sort of an amazing story to think about. But he spent much of the 1940s um, performing in, in what you would call spectacles. He, he would, would race horses as a way to, to raise money. He traveled with the Harlem Globetrotters and during the halftime performance, he would, he would run over hurdles as a, as a form of entertainment. And he really struggled to, to find an economic footing and to benefit from his athletic prowess in ways that a lot of his, his other white, white colleagues and, um, didn't, didn't struggle. And so many of them came back to a segregated America um, and, and had to, to um, fight for, for, for equality. And as I said before, we certainly see that with the case with John Woodruff, who also joined the military, which was, which was quite common for athletes as well. I'm reminded of a, a really disturbing um, episode that happened to John Woodruff after he returned. You know, he was a col when he returned to college, he was actually prevented from competing at a track meet at the Naval Academy in Annapolis because of, of racism. And, and he reflected, and I quote, now here I am an Olympic champion. And they told the coach that I couldn't run. I couldn't come. So I had to stay home because of discrimination. Things hadn't changed. Um, some, some athletes, I have to, just because of the Chicago shout out, I, we, we should say, we haven't talked much about Ralph Metcalf, who is a, a runner at Marquette, um, who wins multiple medals at the, at the games. And, you know, he continues um, to, to persevere in the struggle against racism and becomes a congressman from Chicago. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. A truly complex and fascinating figure. And we can post some links about that um, in the comments. We have just a few minutes left. Uh, so I would like to ask one more question of each of you. Uh, Damien, a viewer named Nils is asking whether you see a connection between this post-1936 change in the meaning of sports that you described and the high representation of African Americans in contemporary sports. What are your thoughts on that? I, I in some ways, I, I'd like to challenge that. I don't, I don't think African Americans are highly represented in sports. African Americans are not the majority of athletes competing in professional sports in America. Certainly they constitute a majority of those in football and basketball. But if we think about the broad spectrum of, of the sports arena, African-Americans still represent a, a significant minority. And I think a lot of it has to do not with, with the idea that African-Americans are somehow um, genetically superior or, or better athletes, it's about opportunity. Many of the other sports have really high barriers to competition. They're quite expensive um, to play in. And so what, what, what we see is that African-Americans are concentrated in, in the sports where there is low entry or in some way subsidized um, entry. If you think about the way sports are, are sort of amateur sports are sort of organized, you know, you don't really get recruited based on your, your high school team's performance, but it's at the club level. For example, example, amateur athletic union 
basketball is really important and teams travel all over the country, but the best teams are subsidized by shoe companies and things like that. However, we don't see that same system in baseball, which also is based on traveling teams and things like that. And the, the barrier to entry, the high cost often means that, that, that you don't get a number of African-Americans involved. Damien, um, you've really just kind of hinted at what are very, very complex threads woven together about social mobility and sport uh, and the way that they function. Um, Danny, in closing, um, our viewers have been debating in the comments section, America and Americans choices to participate in the 36 games. Uh, one viewer named Pam has said it was a bad choice, that it helped make the cruel national socialist regime look legitimate to the world. Um, but another person, Michelle, replied that she felt that African-American athletes and Jewish athletes showed the illegitimacy of the Nazi ideal and embarrassed them. As a historian, how do you reflect on the power of the 1936 Olympics to shape the narrative of Nazi Germany? Well, the, it, the 1936 Olympics are a moment of great triumph um, for Nazi Germany, a moment of international triumph, as, as we've said, where they, um, they convince the world that they belong in the community of nations. And more than that, that they're one of the most advanced of those nations. It is troubling. I, 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 I'm sympathetic with the viewer's comments. It's troubling um, that there is not a more sustained international protest against Nazi Germany. And it's of course tempting to wonder what would have happened if there were uh, widespread boycotts by, by many nations. Uh, Germany may have been uh, deeply embarrassed um, by that, but I, I don't think as a historian, it's always hard to play with counterfactuals, but I don't think as a historian that that would have um, stopped uh, Hitler's ambitions. Um, and in fact, um, right after the games, we see Germany start to, um, to continue to rearm um, in violation of the Versailles Treaty that had ended World War I. We see them um, start to make plans to um, encroach on, on territory, um, and that will continue um, tragically um, with the, the beginning of, of World War II, just um, three years after the Olympics, um, that leads to the Holocaust and the, the death of, of millions of Jews and, and millions of others throughout Europe. Well, on that somber note, I would like to thank you, Danny. Thank you, Damien, very much um, for a really provocative conversation. I'm glad you were here. Thank you. I'd like thank to thank you. our view. Hmm? I'd like to thank our viewers too. Um, hope that it gives you some food for thought about the ways that not for the first time and certainly not for the last time that politics and ideology have been brought into the Olympic arena, um, but also for us to think about the ways that for Americans representing their country at the games could pose ethical quandaries abroad and at home. In fact, it wasn't until September 2016 that the families of the 18 African American athletes from 1936 were invited to the White House to be recognized for those two weeks in August when they had brought glory to their country, but returned home to discrimination and a segregated nation. We hope you viewers uh, will join us again and that we'll see you at our next program on September 9th at 9.30 a.m. Eastern time here in the United States for a program about dangerous efforts to deny history and to distort Holocaust history. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and we look forward to being together again in two weeks. Thank you, bye-bye.